Howard Fuller, and Derek Westmoreland lead that. And they've got this card on your table. We've got some other great programs coming up. The guy coming up next is a small group guru. And I don't care what kind of church you have, you've got to get your people into some kind of a small group. He, he'll help you know how to do that. The second guy coming, used to be up here in Memphis, he's now down in Hattiesburg. He has revitalized an inner city church by helping them get more involved in missions. So two really good, two really good programs coming up. And then I'm so happy that we are planning this golf scramble. And what an appropriate day for us to highlight this. Dr. Jackson's been talking to us about being healthy. And I wanna to appeal to you for you to think about getting out on the golf course with us on Monday, April 15th. It would do you a world of good to have some fun with the guys and to get some sunshine and some fresh air and have a lot of laughs and good time. There's two reasons we're doing this golf scramble. Number one is for your emotional health. We want to encourage you. Number two, and this breaks my heart, I didn't know until recently we've got children in the school system here that are homeless. Yeah, you heard me right. Now the politically correct term is housing insecure. But they are homeless. They might, they might be sleeping under the bridge or they might be sleeping on their aunt's couch. But we're hoping to raise $10,000 to offset a homeless crisis in our Shelby County Schools. So look at this. There's a couple ways you can help. Number one, get a foursome from your church. It's $100 a person. But you're going to get free lunch, you're going to get a golfing free, you're going to get a bag of balls to hit, and there's going to be prizes. The other thing is we need some sponsors. And it's very affordable. Your church or that businessman in your church might want to sponsor a whole. And it's a great way um, to help a good cause and to get your name out. <laughs> Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for being here. This material has been excellent. Give me a hand, guys. <clears throat> he does so much stuff all over uh, the area. Uh, preaches somewhere most every Sunday. Uh, we're going to go till about 1 o'clock. Uh, Dr. Jackson's going to come and share a few more things, and then we're going to have a Q&A time, and here's how we're going to do that. All of you have Mitch's cell number, right? Yes, got it? Okay, if you have a question, text that question to Mitch, and then he will help Dr. Jackson uh, in facilitating those questions. That'll just kind of streamline things and help us, help us just a little bit, okay? Dr. Jackson. Thank you guys for uh, a time for the opportunity, and uh, I just want to give honor to all of you as, as ministers and also give honor to the leadership. Um, I think probably David was the emphasis of me being here today, and I, I greatly appreciate that. I know my wife has been praying this morning. I would not embarrass David. Uh, and probably David's wife has been praying that as well. So I've been trying to be on my best behavior. I can do that for about 90 minutes. So um, the coach is about to turn into a pumpkin, I think. So um, how much I talk for the next uh, 52 minutes, depends on you guys. An hour and a half is a long, long time to listen to anybody. It's actually a long time to talk. I was kind of wearing myself out at the end. So thank you guys who stuck with it. For those of you who couldn't be here, um, the slides are available to you guys. I'll make those available through through our, through uh, the, the mention, the others. Um, if you have any questions or comments, if you were here for the first session, if you have any questions or comments, please, please go ahead and forward those to Mitch now, and um, we'll handle those with the job. I do not have a slide set for this section. I intentionally want to leave this open to you uh, for your uh, participation and to make this a, a multilateral conversation rather than a, a soliloquy. 
Uh, I didn't do any Shakespearean training, so uh, the last hour and a half is about as much soliloquy as I've got in me. So um, anyway, if you receive anything, just raise your hand and, and, and uh, pop off there. Um, I do want you, has everybody had a chance to see the Who 5? This is what I affectionately call the Who 5, World Health Organization 5 scale. Um, now, the Who 5 has been used all over the world. It's been translated into many, many different languages. If you search WHO-5 on your uh, Strong's Concordance Google, you will find it everywhere. Uh, and it's been used in mental health arenas. It is a measure of psychological resilience. So if you notice in your churches, there are people that it seems like, you know, cancer, grandkids move off, lose the job. It doesn't matter. They're back there next Sunday. God is good. God is great. You know, they're just, they're like weeble wobble people. You just punch them and they come right back up. And then there are others that seem very fragile. And they're kind of, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take much to, to knock them off course. And they need extra care and all this. So obviously we're not here to, to denigrate people or make fun of any way. But people just have different levels of resiliency. So, um, the who five, the, the way it's organized, if you look at people in your congregation, whether they're leaders, followers, or some mix of the two, there's the idea of wellness and illness. Now, we think of health as being the absence of illness, but it's really more than that. Health is the presence of wellness. So if, I, if somebody said, how's your blood pressure? And you said, well, it's not high. It, you know, it was 190 over 110 last week, but it's not high. But if you didn't have any blood pressure, that's not good. Like there's there's only one cure for that if Jesus doesn't walk by. And that's, you know, cremation or burial. So the presence of wellness is also necessary for health, not just the absence of illness. Okay? And if you look at resiliency, basically, I y'all may not be four quadrant people. I love four quadrant graphs. It's just my way my brain works. And, all these personality tests and all this kind of mess. I love it. This is just kind of fun. It's not a wheelhouse. I just find it interesting. So if you look at illness and wellness, in my practice, whether it's at West, whether it's at my primary practice, whether it is uh, in the church, I see people that fit in these four quadrants. Okay? So one of the problems is very understandable, and that is people who have a high level of illness and a low level of wellness. So let's picture somebody who's very ill, stage four pancreatic cancer. Someone like that would be expected to be in this con, they would be expected to be in this quadrant. They have high illness and low wellness. You don't expect that guy to cut the grass because pretty sick, chemo, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? On the opposite end of that spectrum, on the opposite end, is somebody who has a uh, uh, basically they have a high level of wellness and a low level of illness. So basically they're out here and they're thriving. That's where we'd all like to be, right? Life's good, everything's cool, and I'm very well, very resilient. This, this, a, a, lot, lot, lot of, lot of psychological resilience. So these are, these are the intuitive quadrants. Sympathy, casserole brigade, prayer list, everybody's sympathetic toward you. You're not expected to run the committees because you got a challenge in life. Struggling folks. Then there's folks who are thriving. But there are two counterintuitive quadrants, and one of them is enviable and one of them is pitiable. And one of them is the people who have um, high wellness, excuse me, high illness, but high wellness. And those people, they are the resilient. And this is who the, the people I was talking about. I actually have people with stage four cancer that pray for me. It's pretty embarrassing because my, my appointments go in one month, two months, and three months scenario. So I'm kind of living a time capsule every day because for them, the last time they saw me, like my, my clinic has gone on and on and on. But the last time they were there is the, their impression of me is the last time they saw me. And so I'll see them. And if, if I had a cold three months ago, I'll have Mrs. Jones who says, how are you? Are you better? And she's got stage four cancer. You know, okay, I've been praying for you. That's really humbling. <laughs> I sneezed once and you, you've got all these problems, but these people are resilient. Like they, they have a high degree of wellness even though they have 
have a high degree of illness. And I think we'd all like to be in that quadrant. We'd all like to be in that category of somebody that's hard to keep down, we're resilient, we, we keep up the fight, we do well. There's another quadrant which is counterintuitive, and that is the languishing quadrant. Now, I said, we're, we're not going to denigrate or make fun, it, it, but these are folks that struggle to have personal motivation. They struggle to have like an internal body clock of things to do. And, 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 um, these are folks that basically life happens to, and they don't have a strong sense of personal agency. And in the psychological literature, this is known as locus of control. And what is a truism in psychological literature, if you look at resilient people, they have what's called an internal locus of control. Versus these folks have what's called an external locus of control. So if you're ever around and watching daytime TV, I would urge you to do that one time. You, you may lose faith in democracy. Because you realize that whatever produce is out there, we all have an equal vote. But this, this, is, this, is kind of, this is kind of odd. You watch daytime TV, there's two commercials. One of them is, you have to get this Medicare Advantage plan. And the other one is, we will give you a big check. So it's personal injury attorneys, and this is the Medicare Advantage plan. So both are dealing with injury, loss, and trauma. But in both cases, you're supposed to call this number and someone's going to take care of you. Now, there are legitimate circumstances for all that. My point in bringing that up is, folks, folks that are waiting for someone else to act in their lives for good or ill, you know, it, it, if things go well, it's someone, it, it, it's, it's someone else helped. If things go poorly, it's because of someone else's fault. It, because there are systemic issues and all these things have truth, but in the literature, what you see is that the more people have an external locus of control, the more likely they are to get caught in the trap of not being very sick, but not being very well psychologically. There may not be a lot going on, but they don't, they don't thrive. They don't flourish. And so what's our role as Christian ministers? What, what does the gospel have to say about locus of control? Well, clearly it can't be that we just have an eye lock, an internal locus. I mean, the Christian admits I'm not running the universe, which is antithetical to our culture which is speak your truth. Mm -hmm. How false is that? Jesus didn't say, I'm one version of something that you might embrace if you feel like it. It just depends on where your construct was and how you were raised. And that, that, that wasn't his claim. His claim was, I am one of eight billion truths. It's not what the gospel says. Mm -hmm. You've all preached this. I'm the truth, the way, the light. So, Jesus makes a stupendous truth claim, which places him squarely at odds with contemporary culture. We Christians freely admit we're not in charge of the universe. So it's not, it's a paradox as most things in Christian gospel. We are teaching people not that their personal agency is the key to their success. We are teaching people that systemic factors are not the key to their success. Because the religious right or the, the political right in this country, pardon me, the political right in this country says, your challenges in society and your challenges individually are because of a failure of individual moral obligation and responsibility. And so everybody needs to do better. That's the right, that's the conservative view. On the left, we have a liberal view, which is people struggle because of systemic factors that they didn't choose. And so what people need is more opportunity, economics, education. They need more mentorship. They need more resources. So the, the right tends to say, you need to do better with what you have. And the left tends to say, you need more things to do better with. The gospel says, neither of those are completely true. That's right. That there are elements of truth in both of those. But the gospel is, what you need is not more resources, you need a, you need a revolution in yourself, not in society. It, it says, you don't need your personal morality to be better. You don't need a better version of you. You, you need to die and have Christ resurrected in you. And so what does this mean for locus of control? The Christian has a weird deal because the Christian realizes that the locus of control is external, the eminence of God, or excuse me, the transcendence of God. 
but that we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to be in relationship with the locus of control of the universe. So the, the amazing part of being a Christian or being a Christian minister is that you realize the power that rules the universe is in relationship with you. And so you can't control that. This is not the Wizard of Oz. And despite what the best so-called prosperity gospels preach, preachers preach, it's, it's God is not Santa or a genie that you rub. You don't sow a seed of $5 and expect your lottery ticket to scratch off, right? It's, it's not the meaning, and God does bless. I get all that. But, but we don't control the God in the box. Israelites taught us that. God is outside the box as well as in, and he is the control of the universe, and so that makes us resilient. Okay, just a little bit of background about the who, five, and how I see it, how I view it. I told you that when my score's below 20, I just stop my inbox. And I stop new projects because as a recovering people pleaser supporter for me to not work. Because then I begin to under deliver and I feel worse rather than better. And I fail people that I don't need to fail when I overcommit. So that's how I use the divide. So I'm not asking any of you to reveal your score, but if you are willing to do that, you can just raise your hand and call out your score if you're willing to do that. I will start and I will tell you that I've had a pretty good couple of weeks and my score has been 23. You don't have to multiply it by four or anything. You can just do the raw score. My score has been 23, which means that if I have another opportunity in my life, I'll take it on. I'm not telling you to use this scale to, to, in that measure. I'm just telling you how I use it personally. This is a metric that I do about every six weeks just to tag in on myself. And remember that I, I said the Holy Spirit, your spouse, the people at your table, and, and accountability, these are preferable to metrics. This thing doesn't make you spiritually authentic. <laughs> that's, that's, that's paganism. There's no tool that makes us right except God's spirit, God's word. But this can be a tool to kind of check in on yourself, just kind of looking at the gas gauge on your car. So anybody would want to just, thank you, sir. Uh, before I respond, uh, I give notice, I wasn't here to hear what, what you have to say. I promise you I'm not trying to trap you. <laughs> and, and, and a little bit hesitant only because uh, when you uh, gave the score, uh, I, I thought, wow. But let me just give my score. My score is 21. 21. And I think that's a great score. Now, for me, because of the peace and war, now I've been through a whole lot this last uh, number of months. And there are some things that are on edge even present. However, because I have the firm position of God's vision and have been able to see God do things, it's been a joyful ride okay. in the midst of all of that because for me, the joy of it is seeing the model of what God has done with me, around me, ways of doing things I had no idea except so that that's what causes this score. Uh, can, can everyone can everyone hear our colleague? No. It, so just in summary, he was saying that his score is 21, but this is because he's been relying on the Lord that di things have been difficult or there have been some challenges oh, yeah. over the last few weeks to months, and yet his confidence is in the peace of God, and therefore, so this is exactly what we were talking about, brother, was this idea of resiliency, though. So. It, it may be a medical diagnosis that's trapped, but when I'm saying illness here, illness stands for all things that are negative to our thriving and flourishing in Christ. Whether those are physical, emotional, social, professional, ministerial, financial, it's, it's just challenge, level of challenge in our life. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have a good sense of wellness or spiritual and emotional health or psychological health, even though we're in great challenge. That resiliency is about being able to roll with the punches, you know, to, to kind of, to deflect and, and, and all of that. Okay, anyone else willing to share your score? 20. 20, okay. So we got a 20. Anybody else? I got a 20. You got a 20? I came to the wrong room. None of you guys need my lessons today. So <laughs> I'm clearly in the wrong crowd. <clears throat> Excellent prophecy, terrible discernment. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm mature, I'm 21. 21. Anybody else? 18. 18. 
All these are, are, are very good resiliency scores. Anyone else feel to share? If you refer to the recent weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, well, it's uh, 23. 23. Overall, my ministry is <laughs> yeah. we've, all, we've all had some days, right? We've all had some days. So all of these are fairly good scores. In terms of correlating with the negative, the negative side and the illness side, basically where this starts to flip is at 13. A score of 13 or below on the WHO5 correlates fairly tightly with major depressive episodes. And so there's a whole separate talk that we can talk about about where mental, spiritual, and physical illness intersect and what we need to do when we are ill. And, you know, uh, we've been sometimes guilty of saying pray more when people have biologic dysfunction. And on the other hand, we sometimes pretend that uh, Prozac will, will solve all spiritual ills, and both of those are errors. So God designed us as, as tripartite beings. We have body, mind, spirit. We have to have to work through all of that. That's a different, separate issue. But just so you know, um, 13 or below does correlate with uh, more serious mental challenges that, like we're talking about, might be global and not just a situation of burnout or a, or a professionalized, like compartmentalized dissatisfaction or, or missing track. Yes, sir. I'll be honest with you, a few years, 150 pounds ago, I was probably at a 13. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and I've, had, I've, I've had those uh, Elijah moments in my life. David can tell you some of those stories. Um, and, and I've related to him that there have been times in my life when I, you know, the juniper tree looked like a joy banquet uh, compared to what I was experiencing. I, I, I didn't just have moments of not wanting to be alive. I actually went through a, a sustained period of my life when I did not want to be alive and I actually um, wished when I went to bed that I would not awaken. And I, I had that happen for an extended period of my life, uh, months, years. So I haven't always enjoyed the sense of, of wellness that I enjoy today. And I thank God for bringing me through those times and for giving me his grace to do that. So the last thing I want to do today, both in the talk or in now, it is somehow present some type of, of, of bumper sticker theology or, or, or Hallmark card, you know, everything happens for a reason and uh, it's all great. I've got this all figured out and everything. I, I, I come to you as a feller confessor of wanting to do good in the earth at the, at, at the command of God, but recognizing that, that we all have to approach that in humility or, or you know, we're, we're just asking for trouble. And so that's been my experience. Anyone else want to share your score? Okay, yes, sir. I have a question. Yes. Uh, about the scoring. Yeah. And I recognize the fact that it goes over two weeks, you know, but there are certain days, anniversaries, things that have happened that really affect these five areas on that day or approaching that day. And yes. that season of the year, it really devastates these numbers. How then do you use this in those times when those times are so different yeah. than the norm? So most of us have some times that, you know, maybe a day in the year, maybe a season, it may Sometimes it's an experience in a place. Sometimes it's a conversation. You know, deja vu, nostalgia. So nostalgia is the pain of the things you miss. Deja vu is just an experience of, of man, we've been here before, or a connection. You know, uh, there are things that happen in my life that bring to mind. For some of us, it can be a smell or, or, or whatever. You know, it, it just it brings you back to a negative experience. I'm very fortunate in my life that for most of the negative experiences, I can go back to it cognitively but the Lord has allowed me the grace where it's very, very difficult to get back to it emotionally. When I remember some of the bad things, I, I can remember that it happened. It's not like it wasn't me, but I have a difficult time feeling that fight or flight response and that feeling of, oh my God, I can't get through this and all that kind of stuff, you know? And so that's good, but I do recognize that there are times when there, when there are gonna be dips. If, if you've lost a, a treasured family, 
loved one, or if you've gone through a ministerial reversal, if you've had a family trauma, if you had a bomb go off in your life, emotionally, socially, spiritually, some of those things can be, you know, I know triggers so overused these days, but honestly, we can go through experiences that affect these things. Uh, this last weekend, you know, the gentleman that I, that I talked about that had a tremendous reversal in his own personal ministerial life, uh, his family stayed intact. But I sat at one of these tables with eight, eight people around it. My friend, you know, we, we were all, the three of us were best friends. And my friend is getting honored for a 20 year pastorate at the 60th anniversary of the church. And then my, my other friend is also seated at this table with me. And so that brought back a lot of memories, right? And so thank God for his grace and his mercy on all of us and, and all of that. And, uh, there's been so much restored in terms of a family uh, blessing and all those kind of things. But for me, that brought back some, some feelings of vulnerability and some feelings of, wow, things won't always work out as we thought they were going to work out. And so for me personally, the value of using the who through time is when I, when I know these things, uh, if it's an average or a challenge or whatever, if I know what my baseline is, like if you're always 16, then, you know, Eeyore is, is good. God loves Eeyore. He loves Tigger too. God loves Pooh and you know, all that. You know, there are different people with different personality states. I tend to be a high energy person. I almost never score, score below a five on my life is filled with things that interest me. Because almost everything interests me. I mean, I just, I just love, you know, watching things grow. I love watching people grow. I love new projects and all that. That's not my problem. So I'm always like, like on my deathbed, I'll get a five. Unless I got bad dementia. So for me, knowing what my baseline is and the deviation from baseline gives me some metric warning and, and analytic warning that, hey, I need to pay special attention right now. I, uh, I've, uh, I like to do steam song. Golf is not my thing. If I went with y'all, it would not be good fellowship. Y'all would have lots of laughter. It would be at me. I want to relax. I do not want a game with a score. I don't like board games. I don't like, like I do, my professionalism is such a competitive world that I just, I just don't want that in my relaxation time. I'd rather walk around the field with steers and chickens and stuff. They complain too, but I don't know it because I don't know their language. <laughs> so that for me is therapeutic. But if, if, I know, if I know that these are vulnerable times, then probably what I'm gonna do is I'll probably steam an extra time that week, or I may spend a little bit of extra time with the, the steers. Uh, or I may try to make sure that my wife and I, instead of watching maybe one show that to, to, together that week, which is our relaxation means, we might do that two or three times that week because I know something's coming up. So the value is dual. Don't be fooled by the lows because they're just that. They're not your baseline. But also, during those lows, if you know that they're quantitatively lower than what you expect, they, it's a signal of vulnerability. It's just... It's all of these things, metrics are just lights on your dashboard. Sometimes they're meaningless and you just click the button and make them go away. But other times they're serious. And so knowing the context around the metric is incredibly important. This is a wonderful question. Uh, question. Yes, sir. Let, let me let the other brother speak. Back to you. Yes, sir. 15 years ago, I went through a three or four month season of severe depression. It would be interesting to hear your full story. I mean, I, I, not to be glib, but I think the answer is the grace of God. I mean, I, I really feel that way. I mean, I'm a James 117 person. I don't care if you get healed by a scalpel or if you get healed by chemotherapy or if you get healed by somebody shaking some oil over your head and, and you know, pulling out some of your hairs while they're praying for you. All healing comes from God Amen. to me. Amen. So, you know, I, I think we read the same Bible, maybe some different versions from here and there, but, you know, I would, I was, Reared on the King James, so every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father that lights and conditions no ground, which is the chapel turn. Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't care if you're, you know, a cardiologist at a Baptist hospital, or if you're a Baptist minister with a good heart who's praying for somebody. If if healing and goodness come, they come from God. Mm -hmm. So if you read Henry Cloud's book, he gets a good advice out of that. 
or a preacher preaches a message, you get some good advice out of that. Wisdom comes from the Lord. Amen. If it works, it's biblical. If it doesn't work, it ain't biblical. All right. so that, that's just maybe I'm too silly, or, or but I I think kind of in cartoons like that. that that's just true for me. Um, that, that that's where it comes from. Yes, sir. But you have an additional comment or question? Uh, uh, somewhere in between, uh, between Gregarian raised and Gregarians, and I'm an economist by training. And as an analysis, you say you're an economist or a communist by training. I just want to know. <laughs> a little bit of both. Okay, all right. <laughs> but uh, by training. Uh, so, analysis of some things of interest. Now, now I'm, I'm a little more lost than I was at the beginning because of Gary. Gary, the question they pointed out. Uh, and then you use the term baseline. Now, that's a fuzzy term for me. I'm trying not to hear it now. But I'm all with you. Uh, and that is uh, where God has defined and where faith in, engages, that carries the attitude. Yeah, That's yeah. what I was speaking to a moment ago, yeah. was the attitude that it's going to be okay. Yeah. But my baseline then to me is a baseline of faith. I don't yeah. know what, you know, some others are, but that's it. That's the only thing I know. That makes for how I'm answering. I, I have great expectations of God and fairly low expectations of people. Yeah, that's me. I've been a physician and a pastor too long to to just think that everything's going to work out great. For now, I have very high hopes for the eschaton. Like I, I feel like when Jesus Christ establishes His rule in visible time and space, it's going to be awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. But until then. We're going to have some struggles. And so knowing what my baseline is helps me. And I find that this is a little bit proactive rather than reactive. And I'm like, I think you guys walk into Valvoline or the dealership, and every time they show you the air filter, you say, yes, let's replace that today. Maybe when they say you need to flush your transmission fluid, it's going to be $800. You say, yes, I have $800. I'd love to flush my transmission fluid today. And I have three hours. I don't need to get anywhere today. Let's change the transmission fluid today. Is there anything else you need to do to maintain my vehicle in pristine condition? I'm like, I want $35 to get my oil change on my get out of here. I mean, that's pretty fun. I practice in the country. So I, I, I need, because of the way I'm wired, I need something to trigger the maintenance for me. Because I tend to be reactive when things break down for me. I get in my car and I assume it to go. And on Monday, I expect my body to work. Mm -hmm. I expect my spirit to work. I expect my mind to work. And sometimes I take that for granted. Mm -hmm. And so part of stewardship is not about financial stewardship. It's about personal stewardship and recognizing that me as an engine, I don't work well unless I maintain well. And so this is a means of kind of forcing some proactive maintenance in my life. Sorry, brother, get your comment question. No, I have a question. Do women, on average, have a higher baseline score than men? My wife, according to this test, would have a very high baseline. She's had everything you can think of happen to her. I mean, just you name it, it's happened to her. From Calvary down, being held up on robber to car wrecks to almost dying from a physical injury. And yet she just seems to shake it off. So with, with the average woman, would they have a higher baseline due to their makeup as a female? They would not. Really? They would not. Um, females have some advantages in social connectivity. Females have what? Some advantages in social connectivity. So one of the things, and there's a whole set of lecture on wellness and gratitude and happiness also. <coughs> gratitude is a hoof booster. It's a resiliency booster. It gives your brain just extra leeway, right? Um, social connectedness. The challenge with today's society is it's not how many friends you have, it's the depth of relationship. Yes. So they studied unwed African American single mothers of, of, of babies in poverty. So you, you stack up the social risk factors for having a negative experience. Those are difficult psychosocial circumstances and social economic and, and social determinants of health, all that stuff. In Baltimore, that's a pretty tough lineup. And what they saw about these young mothers who were in extremely challenging social and personal conditions 
was that it was having two or three deep relationships that led to their psychological resilience. But what our society is, people think the human heart is, is infinite. It's not. God's infinite. We're not. So if you got 100 units of social value, instead of putting 30 units of peace in three really good friends, I call those the 3 a.m. people. David can call me at 3. He knows to call him out and text because text doesn't wake me up. But he can call me at 3. I'm a 3 a.m. friend. And I'm not that for everybody, but I am for him, and, and I have some little friends in my life. Rather than short number of very deep relationships, what we've done is everybody now has 300 friends on Facebook, but it's only this deep. So there's lots of likes, but there's no love. And people don't have... And people are spreading. See, we all need affirmation, but everybody's getting that neurochemical hit off of opening this thing rather than depth of relationships. So there's a number of guys here today. I'm, I'm very happy about that. But if you think this is your peer group that's going to keep you resilient, you're swimming upstream against the data. The data are that you don't need a group like this to keep you resilient. And, and this is good, okay, but this... This is cognitive and fellowship type stuff. What you need is somebody, there, there's a reason why I said, who's at your table when I talked about accountability and, and resiliency, rather than who's at your banquet hall. Because it needs to be, so you know, worship happens in, row, in rows, fellowship and accountability happens in oaks. It's the people that you're seated around, you're two or three, four people that are your 3 a.m. people that make you resilient. So to answer your question, sir, women do not have higher scores on resiliency, typically. In fact, the opposite is true. Whatever mental illness it is, except for bipolar one and except for schizophrenia, which uh, are either even or a little bit male dominated. In terms of major depressive disorder, women are twice as likely to experience major depressive disorder than men. And so there's some controversy in literature about this, whether it is genetic, and I think there is some genetic component to it, but that flies in the face of everybody's gender expectations today because they can't define what a woman is, but then the data show that women are twice as likely to get an illness. So it's hard to explain that, so that data is kind of buried. So I didn't come here to preach gender politics today, but you know, you can read Genesis 126. I'll let you figure it out. But there's, there's, there's a, uh, women are at higher risk of mental health disorders. And there is a controversy about whether that's true in terms of their experience or if it's true in terms of their socialization that it's okay for women to express mental stress because of their societal expectations versus men who are expected to be John Wayne. And so typically we either fight or drink rather than talking about how we feel. So if you look at primary care visits, there are twice as many female primary care visits as there are male primary care visits. Go to your doctor's office, unless you're at the urologist, God help you. All the magazines there are women's magazines. There may be a field and stream in there thrown in for good measure or men's health, but 19 out of 20 magazines will be women's magazines. So your doctor's also It's just the healthcare system is set up to, to accommodate women. And so there's some concern about maybe men have more mental health challenges than we are actually discovering, but those are the data well, at currently, wild type, women will have twice as much mental illness. Uh, somebody else had their hand up? Thank you, sir. This sheet is all about how I felt, I feel, I feel. And uh, as I say, today I'm 21, and this time last week I stood before this group because uh, I was facing a, uh, a funeral the next day for one of the most precious ladies in our church, in a small church. And I'm not in that kind of church where you know, you know you're an inch deep and a mile wide. Everybody's an inch. Yes, we're a family. Good. We're a very close family. Good. This lady was on the pastor search committee that brought me there 31 years ago. So last week I was pleased with you guys for your prayers and I appreciate it, by the way. We had a glorious day as we celebrated. We had uh, a homecoming and a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. Great. But uh, uh, even last week I felt overwhelmed by the responsibility I had, but I felt good in the fact that the Lord was going to sustain me. And, uh, and so uh, this number not always about me, it's about what's going on in the people I care about. This is a light on the engine dashboard. This is not the health of your car. It's not the health of your soul. It's one indicator. 
But, you know, so having people that know you and, and know your facial expression, you know, have spouse, uh, trusted spiritual fellow disciples, you know, the two guys on the road to Emmaus. They didn't know much. Clearly, they're walking with Jesus, don't even know. It's, they're kind of, they're loser disciples as far as we're concerned, as far as like their perception. But they do enough to walk together. And Amos will tell you that's good, you know, in Ecclesiastes, you know. Because you need agreement, you need somebody who'll pick you up. So I you to hear the phrase that he said, you know, the Lord's gonna sustain me, and then the public confession of, hey guys, pr proactively, hey, I think I'm gonna be in a tough spot here. I think this could be emotionally challenging for me. My words, not yours. I'm, I'm presuming what you said and summarizing. But then would you pray for me? So isn't that what we should be telling our followers to do? Yes. And isn't that what we should do as followers of Christ? I mean, Paul says it. Right? He's pretty honest about his emotional state. He didn't say Demas forsook Jesus. That's not what he says. He said Demas forsook me. Pastoring is personal. And we fool ourselves when we try to professionalize it in a way that, that doesn't, if, if, we, if, we, if we refuse to acknowledge the personal, it will acknowledge you and it will bite you squarely on the tail. Mm -hmm. For, forgive me, but it, it will if we continue to, to refuse to acknowledge it. So helping, and, and Paul also said, Paul also said, you know, I came to Rome and nobody stood with me. No one. He's very honest about that. But then he, he, he says, but I've asked the Lord to not. Basically, don't lay it to their charge that Jesus stood with me. What a wonderful thing that he, he, he recognized that Christ sustained him in this hour of his potential death by execution. And yet, it's kind of interesting because where did he learn to pray don't lay it to the charge? Well, there was a guy he watched get stoned while he was holding the coats. And that guy said, hey, don't let to the charge. And Stephen was imitating a guy that was on a cross who said, don't lay the sin to the charge. And so you see this prayer of absolution make its way from the cross to Stephen stoning to Paul's trial in Rome as he's learned from, you know, Paul learned from Stephen who learned from Christ how to be resilient. And, and I, reckon, I don't mean to be sacrilegious and say that Jesus was psychologically sick. I mean that Jesus modeled for us a proper spiritual attitude that will lead us to, to, to health. Because only forgiveness is healthy. Everything else is suspect. And so it is a great personal awareness and, and a good model for us all. Yes, sir. So would it be appropriate or accurate to, if I may draw a original picture, to say, you're human beings, that's their figure. And this is the reality of life, external forces that come upon all of us. And that's what makes us who and what we are, under which those forces, pressures that we normal uh, person would collapse, while Jesus died on the cross and gave us his word, if it is not instilled within that, it, it will collapse. And yeah. that's what helps us to withstand those external pressures that makes us who we are and how we function. Yeah. That's who you are. So it is about us. Yeah. This is about us and how we respond. And that's the difference between being Christian and non-Christian, where they collapse under those external forces happening, things happening, events and death, you know, funeral or happiness or house burned down or whatever. Happened. And that's where the without that Christ and His Word. They resort to other resources that they ultimately collapse. I think you're right, and I hope you guys can hear me say these external forces that bring pressure to all of us. Hopefully, they shape the Christian and inform the Christian. And, you know, clearly, clearly, there's an, there's an efficacy of suffering in the world. There's something that God gets from us through suffering, and, and Paul's prayer was for it. This is a weird prayer. And we've all preached at the Kyle Resurrection Fellowship and Suffering. Everybody signs up on Easter Sunday. Your church role is great on Resurrection Sunday. But call a Golgotha meeting and you'll find out who the real followers are. I mean, we don't like suffering, but there's something about suffering that refines us. And James has a lot to say about that. Uh, Peter has a lot to say about that. That something about suffering refines the Christian. 
one of the things that I mentioned that my, my good friend from this last week, from yesterday, you know, in losing his son, our relationship has grown so much through these intervening 10 years because Tom's a melancholic, he's an introvert, he's, he's an isolationist, he's an artist, he's just, he's just different than I am. We don't have a lot in common except the Lord. But through the suffering, our relationship has grown. It, it's just been kind of an interesting phenomenon with that. I would challenge you, though, that there are many professing Christians who collapse under the weight of external forces. Yeah. Many. And, and I know you know they right. have the equipment given to them, help given to them. Yeah, so By it's just appropriating that. Yeah, and so all of us can be professing Christians, but being a true disciple. And there's a difference professing Christians. There is a. Possessing Christians. Possessing professors, yes. professing Christians without possessing the power of the Holy Spirit. And that that division doesn't stop between the pew and the rostrum, guys. Mm -hmm. We're all we're all having to practice what we preach. Yes. And it's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. And so I can think of, again, I am not trying to stand before you saying I'm I'm a past master, I've got all of this in tow and I, I perfectly embody this because I'm a learning Christian, and, and I want to be more like what he, he says to be. Yes, sir. Clay, six years ago, my wife and I both with Huntington's disease, which is a debilitating disease. So sorry. No, no cure for it. And it is, it's like a semi truck. Her dad had died of Huntington's, but still, it, it was devastating. Uh, immediately, we went to seek out a Christian counselor. Yes, sir. He was Episcopalian, but he was a Christian. And he helped us. We, sit, we went to him every other week for about a year. Uh, are there any markers that should help us know when to go to a Christian counselor, when to do antidepressants in, in life situations? Uh, great question. And my admiration to both of you guys in weathering that storm together and also your wisdom in approaching counseling early. So, pills work. Dude, I don't care what you're doing this week. They work. They help a lot of people. But they're not a panacea. They don't help everybody. And they're not for every problem. And there is no pill that can undiagnose your loved one with a devastating illness. There's no pill that brings back the loss of a loved one. Or there's no pill that makes divorce unwind. There's just certain life tragedies that are signal events that just shape your life. People say for good or ill, they shape it in both directions. It, we all know this because you, you've all sat at the table and say, it, it's, you know this stuff, but it, it happens to us too. Turns out we're real people. So pills work if the problem is biological. Talking works. Pills and talking work better together. In a situation like this, you know, Christian counselor, they're going to be able to understand your worldview hopefully better than a non-Christian counselor. Maybe. It's how well they're training. Again, just because they put a cross over the door doesn't mean that they are working from a gospel mission. It's just, you know. So the reason why counselors so appropriate for this situation is unless either one of you guys have an antecedent depressive disorder, this is a bolt from the blue that just hits you and you need to talk about it. Yeah. And so I think um, you know, there's a therapy comparative that says everybody needs a therapist. I, I, I think everybody needs truth. Mm -hmm. I think everybody needs wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so you can read that, you can listen to it, you can pay somebody $80 an hour to give it to you. You know, it, this wisdom works and we all need wisdom. And we all need wisdom that comes from outside ourselves because none of us has been human very long. I mean, who knows how to, under, who knows how to undergo that journey? Who knows how to undergo the loss of a loved one? Who knows that? And so accumulated wisdom over time from scripture and outside of scripture, so long as it brings true with the basic things that we find in the Bible, is helpful. Um, I think it's just really good to have a good primary care doctor. And, and I am one, so there's your full disclosure. But, you know, just a lunatic with a prescription pad is not going to help you. You know, but a good primary care doctor that knows you. What's what's the value of a good primary care doctor? Somebody that doesn't have to look at your chart to know what your name is. Somebody who knows your family, a little bit about your family history, 
and somebody that, although they are rushed, you don't feel rushed when you're in front of them. Somebody you can talk to. I would advise you never to lie to your doctor, your pastor, your accountant, or your lawyer. If you're going to break the Big Ten, just don't break with those guys at least. Get in trouble with God either way, but if you break with those four, you get in trouble down here too. And you need a doctor you can talk to. And they, you know, those guys have a pretty good idea. Those ladies have a pretty good idea if medicine would help you or not. But in this in a situation like that, I mean, counseling is so helpful. But again, all counseling do is to give you the wisdom. And again, I don't keep referencing yesterday, but one of the one of the most one of the most profound statements about ministry I've ever heard came from Tom. And years and years and years ago, a ministerial training session, he sat down with us and he said, look, don't ever do a hospital visit to get it off your list. You're just better off not going. Because, and he, again, he pulled this so way out of context, you know, Warren Wiersbe would be spinning in his grave. But he, he, he's looking at uh, James, the letter kills and the spirit gives and he was talking about being spiritually motivated versus being motivated by the letter of the law. And he said, when you go into a hospital visit to check it off your list to move on with your day, those people have been sitting waiting on hope all day long. And they're going to be sitting there when you leave. And you represent the hope of God to those people because you are an incarnational agent in their arena. And if you walk in and you're just checking off the box, you don't bring life. You bring death. Mm-hmm. And they'll be more discouraged after you leave than they were before you came because they were staying, their hopes were so high. Mm-hmm. I think there's a real ministerial truth to that. And I, you know, we can you go through all the exegesis and see if it works or not. And, but it's to me, it was a challenge mm-hmm. to stop putting people on my to-do list yeah. and, and to get them on my being present list. And if I can't do it in the right spirit, just don't do it. That's right. Because at least I can, you know, in medicine, I'm trying to first do no harm. I think that'd be a good motivation for us as ministers as well. At least don't be more discouragement to people. Because I was, you know, I was checking my phone, I was supposed to be praying with them, or I was, you know, just, you know, looking at the clock and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You, you've all been treated that way by somebody somewhere sometime. And if we can avoid treating people that way, that are in crisis, I think it's, it's, it's heavily important. I'd like to close with, with that thought of those who are suffering and what we do. Um, there is, specifically with mental health, there's a controversy in the contemporary church about whether we have stigmatized people who have mental health or whether we should privilege their voice of the suffering. And there's kind of a cultural Marxism, and you can read about it by Rod Dreher, no matter how you feel about it, he's an insights, but there's an idea that in our culture, um, what gives value to people in some arenas is the perception of victimhood, that, that there's value in being the oppressed. And so we, there's, there's a theory of ideology that is if, if you are not succeeding exactly how you want to, it's because someone's oppressing you. And uh, I, I think that we as Christians should be very careful in responding to this, responding to this because if we just speak and rail against the cultural ideologies that come, so-called cultural imaginaries, we miss great opportunities to minister to people the truth of the gospel. And, and, you know, there's a long history of how we've done that, but, you know, as it is. Do we stigmatize people or do we privilege them? And so, um, a young theologian, uh, it's kind of a Catholic background, her name is Jessica Koblenz, and, and Jessica and I, we've corresponded about it. She, she's written a book called Dust of the Blood about depression. And uh, Jessica feels that for people that are suffering, we need to do the first seven days of Job's friends, and that's it, that's all. That when you go up and you say things like, everything happens for a reason, or God bless your sister, it's gonna be fine, let's pray a prayer, that glib answers hurt people. She's got a point, and she takes my lot to task about the, the DSM-5 diagnoses and the over-medicalization of human suffering and existential crises that we're throwing Prozac onto and all these types of things, and she's got a point about that. And, and I, I applaud her for that, and I, I'm on board with that part. But what Jessica does is she says, you've got to privilege the voice of the oppressed to where all theology can do is collect some potential meanings that people might choose from in their suffering. 
and you can't say anything to them about it because you haven't suffered what they're suffering. So the purpose of Christian ministry, according to Jessica, is to stand with a happy meal of meaning, a Burger King, and they choose one through 12 what their meaning is, and you stand there. So the Reformed have got their construct, and the Pentecostals have got theirs, and the Southern Baptist, and then the, the National Baptist, and then the round-the-back Baptist, and on-the-side Baptist, and all the, you know, AOG, PGOC, <laughs> alphabet soup. And we all get our little meaning packets, and people choose the meaning that they want. Because we have nothing to say. It's immoral for us to force on the people meaning that they're not choosing. Fits perfectly into I speak my truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And she takes as her index case Hagar. Hagar is a terrible story. I never would have told it if I were God. I'd have kept it quiet. <laughs> Because this is, a, this is an era where the covenant people of God treated Hagar wrong. Yeah. Right? If you like the heroes, Christine, don't read Genesis. It's an awful book <clears throat> in terms of how we do in actually as humans. You got this lady who just, you know, I can get my head around Near Eastern culture and using her body. I can, I can get my head around that. I can, I, can, I can read the story and not call it sex trafficking until... If you're going to treat her like family, you can't kick her out in the wilderness and say, hope you find some water. Like, I feel like you got to pick. She's either family or she's not. And the way Hagar gets treated is wrong. Yeah. And that's the index case. But Jessica would say that Hagar's got to wait there by the well and you've got nothing to say about her. But here's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Hagar, by the way, this Egyptian unwed mother slave kicked out vagabond you want to stack up social determinants of health and who's got a problem who's been oppressed this is the first person in the bible that gets to name god god's first name from human lips comes from hagar and i'm telling you about it three thousand years later god's first name from our lips was the god who sees <clears throat> So the first thing we can say to the suffering is God sees you. That's biblical. We can say that bottom line, flat-footed. Secondly, God stands. God's presence was not far off from Hagar and her suffering. Regardless of her embarrassing position, God stood with her in her suffering. And our scripture says that the Lord is nigh to them that are a broken heart. So we have plenty of Bible to tell people God sees you, and God stands with you. I haven't said anything incorrect or anything offensive so far. Thirdly, the God who sees and the God who stands is the God who speaks. Regardless of whether Jessica is willing to authorize me as a speaker for God, God does speak for himself to suffering people. So he sees them, he stands with them in solidarity, and he also speaks to them. God has something to say about suffering. And finally, the God who sees, the God who stands, and the God who speaks is the God, yes, who saves. So years later, this Egyptian lady rolls into Egypt, gets a wife for Israel, he becomes a great archer. Nations arise from his loins. And at Abraham's funeral, guess who's there? Not just Isaac, but Israel. There are three, there are two people in human history that hold a claim to the Islamic faith, the Christian faith, and the Jewish faith. One of them is Abraham, father of the monotheist religious, father of the faithful. He sees lionized through history as being a seminal figure that led to this, this Near Eastern understanding of God as one. The other person that is revered by all three of those religions is the slave girl. You think God doesn't sustain people who are suffering? So no matter what your challenge is today, God is with us. He's here. Would you pray with me today? I'd just like to pray a blessing over each of you. And I just want to thank you so much, sincerely, for allowing me to be here today. It's been a thrill for me. I've looked forward to this meeting ever since David hinted it might happen. And I've just I've been in prayer for this meeting. And I have I've earnestly prayed that God would bless you. And I covet your prayers as well. I want to stand with my brother and, and, and ask for your prayers. We have a child who has special needs. My 22-year-old is not walking with God the way that he needs to be right now. And we're trying to plant a church and 
all this kind of things. Everything I've spoken about today, I need the grace of God to, to reign over me uh, in both senses. Hydroponic and, and uh, the authority reign as well. So let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for every one of these men. I thank you for their ministries. I thank you for the churches and people that they serve. I thank you for their families, and I thank you, Lord, for their friends. And we thank you especially for this meeting, for the host church of Bellevue and their hospitality, for the meal that we received today, and for the words that we have shared together, especially in this session, Lord, where so many have been courageous to open their hearts and their minds and their spirits to one another. And I thank you for what I have perceived at this place, how that we can pray one for another and love one another and support one another. I pray now for you to take whatever this time has been in all of our minds and to sanctify it through your spirit for our good, for your name's sake, for your kingdom's sake, for, for those who follow us for their sake, and particularly for our family's sake. Make us not better men, but make us regenerate men that have the power of your Holy Spirit working within and through us. Let us walk worthy of the vocation we're with you have called us. For it's for your name, Lord, that we pray and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.